Hmm? Yeah, baby. Hmm. You can't sleep. Oh, that sucks gorgeous. Any idea why? Not particularly. That's okay. Of course it is. Sometimes we just can't sleep. There doesn't need to be a reason for it. Hmm. Do you, um, do you want me to ramble to you until you drift off? I know that helps sometimes. Yeah? Okay, let me just, um, think of a super boring topic. Yeah, give me a sec. Mm. Oh, um, <laughs> how do you feel about philosophy? <laughs> I can almost guarantee it will put you to sleep. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Get comfy then. Mm hmm. Yeah, come here. Settle in however you want to. <laughs> you good? All comfy? Okay. Here we go then. Um. Hmm. Now, where to begin? <laughs> I could start with Plato. That um, seems like a pretty good place to start. Yeah? Okay. Well, Plato was um, around 5th century BC, I think. Yeah, don't quote me on it. <laughs> but he was a rationalist, which means he um, believed that knowledge was like acquired through reason and being able to like logically kind of think it through. Yeah, whereas, um, you know, like philosophers like Aristotle are um, empiricists. Uh, yeah, which essentially just means that um, they believe that uh, knowledge is, like, acquired through the senses um, and more of, like, experiences, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Plato, uh, like, made his whole, like, thing. <laughs> yeah, his, his like, um, philosopher, like, philosophical? Philosophical. <laughs> ideas uh, were largely based on Socrates, I think. Um, but because Socrates was poisoned and executed uh, by the state and himself, kind of, um, for the questions he was asking um, and the fact that he was, like, I don't know, corrupting young minds, uh, Plato, like, had to be a lot more discreet about the way he, like, presented his ideas, I guess. Yeah. So he, um, he delivered it through, uh, what we call the cave analogy. Um, simply because that was, like, an ambiguous enough way, an ambiguous enough way to, you know, like, get it out to people without having to deal with super bad consequences, like being forced to drink hemlock. <laughs> yeah. So essentially there's this idea that um, there are these three prisoners chained in a cave um, and they, it's like all dark in there, but behind them people can walk through the cave um, and they do with like torches and stuff. Because of the way the prisoners are chained in the cave, they can't turn around to, like, see who's walking behind them. So they come to know, like, things based on their shadows that are reflected onto the... Reflected seems like the wrong word, but the shadows that are cast <laughs> onto the wall in front of them. That's, like, the only way they can see things, so... Like, they would, instead of, you know, knowing what a dog is, essentially, they would know 
the shadow it creates on the wall. Um, yeah, or like puppets would be like shown behind them, shown, yeah, like like a like a a puppet display with the shadows of the puppets cast onto the wall in front of them. Um, but then one of the prisoners escapes and manages to leave the cave and step out into the real world uh, with the sun and like the trees and you know everything um and then he or well i think it was a guy <laughs> um goes back to the other prisoners and tells them oh my goodness everything we knew isn't right like this is how it actually looks um and the other prisoners like call him stupid and things because they're like no 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 you can't be right kind of thing this is going somewhere i promise <laughs> but essentially that whole like um scene is used to portray real people real people regular people and philosophers um and the world that we live in um so the prisoners are like representations of like our ignorance um and they're like regular people and then the like person who escapes is meant to be uh, more educated it's um probably yeah, kind of an elitist way of looking at it, but they're meant to be, like, an informed philosopher, essentially. Um, and then the, um, the shadows that are cast onto the wall of the cave, which is our world. Our world is the cave. Um, the, the shadows are, like, material objects, like things that we can find in our world. Um, and then the the real, like, well, the journey that the person who escapes takes to get to the real world with the sun and stuff is, like, meant to represent people, like, acquiring information through rationalism just because it's from Plato, so that's the only way they, like, would. <laughs> yeah, it's meant to be them, like, kind of, like, not what's the word they're just they're gaining more information like enlightened kind of i guess um but they yeah they um the the sun in the outside like outside is like the plato's other idea which is the world of the forms which is essentially this separate world from ours, like this alternate place where there is the perfect form of everything that could ever exist. Like, there's a perfect chair there, and there's um, a perfect person, and a perfect, like, I don't know, desk, and, like, everything, every form that you could imagine has a perfect form in the world of the forms. Ow, my arm. <laughs> No, it's okay, it's just whacked it on the side of the bed. I was gesturing. <laughs> but, um... The, 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 what was I saying? The sun, in Plato's, like, cave theory, uh, represents the highest form, so it's, like, the ultimate, most perfect thing, and all of the perfection and goodness from the sun, in this case, or, like, the perfect form kind of like trickles down into all the other forms um yeah <laughs> it's a little bit of a weird one to kind of wrap your head around but <clears throat> um Plato like he used this idea of like categorization oh maybe we used someone <laughs> Either Plato or us today uses categorization to like kind of like back this up, this idea of the world of the forms, because like um, children can, you know, categorize animals into species kind of innately. Like they just they know 
and what's a dog and what's a cat. But then there's this whole argument about, well, how much of that is taught? And if you know, if you had this, like, separate, if, if you could separate, like, a child from everything else and teach them the wrong words for things and stuff, like, would that mean that it's not innate knowledge? And, yeah, there's a whole... <laughs> Thing about it that essentially um I think the main like the bare bones of the argument is that children um can take like features of a thing and recognize that those features are present in other things and like categorize them together that way yeah but there's this whole thing about how we're all like our oh, oh, souls or maybe Plato didn't believe in souls but like we knew um what the like all the all the perfect forms and things were like we knew that and then through the trauma of being born we forget the like this innate knowledge we have um of all these perfect things yeah <laughs> Well, I mean, it's philosophy, it's, um, I don't think it's supposed to make sense, not properly, like, none of it can ever be fully backed up or explained or said to be true, which is kind of the fun in it, I guess, it's like, how far are you willing to argue this one point? Is this the hill you're gonna die on? <laughs> but yeah. Um, but the, the reason that, um... Plato didn't like empiricism and instead, you know, was like a um, rationalist uh, is because he believed that our senses, you know, let us down. Um, essentially, we're merely seeing, like, the shadows on the wall, um, which are distortions of the truth, so we're always looking at things that aren't quite right, if that makes sense. And... Like, the material world is always, like, our world. It's always in a state of flux, like, it's changing constantly. And because of that, we can't ever have, like, the absolute truth. <laughs> but yeah, like, he believed that our senses could, you know, constantly let us down. Which is, I mean, I, I wouldn't say they constantly let us down, but... Like, I have to wear glasses because I can't see. <laughs> not, not like, very well at least, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that's, like, kind of a way that, you know, our senses could let us down. Um, or, you know, when you think you see something out of the corner of your eye, but there's, like, actually nothing there. and Or you, you hear someone, like, call your name, but actually they didn't. Uh, and you just kind of imagined it. Yeah, things like that. Yeah. I don't know. It's, um... I find it really interesting. Uh, I know it's just kind of... I think it's, um... Interesting because it's... It can be argued, like, any way. Um, and obviously the way that you've, like, grown up and the ideas that you've formed in your own head are gonna influence the way that you think the world works and you'd like your opinions on these philosophers and their ideas um are ultimately gonna always be like a personal choice like or, or a personal opinion because you can't really have objective philosophy <laughs> like someone is always arguing for what they believe to be true and i think it's really interesting um but only if people are willing to actually debate about it, because if someone's going to stand there and <laughs> yell at you and say that they're right and you're wrong and they'll never listen, then that's not... it's not fun. I would rather have, like, a back and forth of, yes, but what about this, and yes, but what about that, because, like, there are, um, there are a lot of problems with, like, a lot of f the philosophical views that, you know, exist and existed years and years ago. Oh well, yeah, there's um 
there's a lot of problems with just Plato series alone, like, like, um, his forms, for example, they're, um, they're too, like, complicated, um, they are overwhelming, um, in the sense that, like, how far does it go, um, do we have the perfect form of, like, a lost bus ticket, or is there the perfect form of an ice cream cone someone dropped on the floor and stepped on, um, like, it's this infinite world, like, if it follows that, it's an infinite world full of, um, infinite forms, and then if that exists, is there, like, does each form have its own perfect form of that? Like, are there forms of forms? And, you know, how far back do we go? Do we, do we have forms of molecules and, you know, like, atoms? And it just gets, like, really complicated and ultimately ridiculous, to be honest. Like, it's, it's a lot (laughs) to, you know exist and to have exist um but also that's just the like whole fact that the world of forms is you know purely built on faith there's no empirical evidence of it existing like plato just kind of went you know what i have decided there's a perfect form of everything and no i have nothing to back this up but i've decided (laughs) you know that ultimately this is true and you just kind of have to accept that yeah it's um yeah (laughs) a lot I mean I don't know there, there are like some positives like the whole like senses not being completely trustworthy all the time and you know that kind of thing but I know I think while Plato's ideas are interesting I don't personally I don't think it's something that I could ever like a hundred percent go yes that is right I think that it is fun to think about but then again I think that that's the same thing I think about all philosophical arguments it's like fun to think about but ultimately I'm not gonna (laughs) agree with it probably yeah (laughs) Hmm, um, well, I guess we looked at Plato, so, uh, we could look at, yeah, I will talk to you about Aristotle next, um, yeah, that's probably the best way to go, I guess. (laughs) So, um, Aristotle was uh, one of Plato's um, students, actually. Uh, I think he's often regarded as the brightest of Plato's students. Um, He followed the traditions of Plato and Socrates, um, but after a while he kind of began to question the beliefs and assumptions he had, um, and also began to question like, Plato's beliefs and assumptions, um, yeah, he, uh, one of the ways that he did this was, um, he rejected the idea of the world of the forms being, um, I think, um, it was separate from this world, I think he believed that, well, he, he thought that there was nothing to be gained from this kind of, like, dualist approach, that, like, the world of the forms couldn't exist separate from ours. Um, he had this whole, like, thought that ideas can't have a real existence just on their own. They have to relate to something here in the physical world of our own experience. Um, yeah. And he, he, like, really believed that observations of the natural world were like, crucial to informing his ideas and to, you know, coming up with these, you know, 
thoughts and <laughs> beliefs and yeah. He, um, I actually think he was like the founder of a lot of the sciences we recognize today, like, I don't know, physics, biology, psychology, astronomy, maybe meteorology as well. I don't know. I might be wrong about that. Um, but yeah, he was, he definitely, yeah, he was smart. <laughs> um, and he had strong beliefs. <laughs> His, um, whole, like, understanding of reality was focused around these, like, questions of cause. So, like, why are things the way they are, and what caused them, and what is the essence of that thing, and why does it exist in this world at all, and, like, things like that. Um, but he also recognised that something can have several different explanations for its existence on, like, different levels. So, we could ask, what is the cause of that desk over there with my laptop on it? <laughs> um, it's kind of... It would be caused by wood because it's a wooden desk and also caused by the person who made it. Um, but also it would be caused because there was a need to have a large, flat, stable surface to work on. And the, like, the desk exists to fulfil a purpose. So it has like a function and an ultimate purpose to perform, which is why it was made in the first place. Um, so he, he believed in this, well, he came up with this idea of, like, the four causes, um, so he, like, there was this idea of the material cause, which explains what something is made from, um, and then there's the formal cause, which gives something its shape and allows it to be kind of identified as whatever it is. And then there's the efficient cause, which is the activity that makes something happen. So, in the case of the desk, um, would be the activity of the carpenter who made it. That would be the efficient cause of the desk. And then there's the, the final cause, which is the objects like purpose or reason for existing, which is like it's, it's telos. I think that's it like, its reason for existence, um, but yeah, that, that one's not too hard to think about, it's just kind of like a way of identifying things and figuring out where they came from and why they exist, it's not super in-depth thing, I don't think, anyway, I think it's pretty, pretty simple, it's kind of a way of, like, classifying things and putting them into little, like, boxes, categorizing, that's the word, <laughs> Um, but Aristotle also had this idea that there must be a prime mover because something must cause different objects in the universe to actualize their potential, to like reach their, their telos, their reason for existing. Um, and he kind of like asked the question, what is the purpose of the universe as a whole? And he realized that the universe is in a state of constant change and motion, um, which means, in his mind, that there must be some kind of efficient cause to make all of those changes and all of that motion happen. Um, he had this idea that there could be an endless chain of cause and effect, but that kind of that one gets hard to think about because that means there's like an infinite regression. There's an infinite backlog of causes and effects. Um, you can't ever reach the thing that started it all, if that makes sense. It's like, like an endless chain, but not a circle, you know? Like, we're not linked. It's never-ending line of things happening and causing other things to happen, if that <laughs> makes sense. Um, but he thought that the cause of the 
universe must be this prime mover, which, you know, he classified as God, but it's essentially just this thing that causes, it's it's a cause that allows everything else to actualize their potential. It allows everything else to fulfill the purpose that they have to completion. Um, but because of this whole cause and effect thing, it has to be something that causes but is not affected itself, and it must also be a being with no potential itself as well, otherwise there would have to be something else that helps it actualize its own potential, therefore not making it the prime mover, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, the, the prime mover, like, causes change and motion by attracting other things towards it, so... It does nothing, but is the object of everything. It, um, it, it helped him make some, like, beliefs on God. Uh, he believed that God, or the Prime Mover, um, couldn't depend on anything else for its existence. Otherwise, it would have to be capable of change, uh, which it, it couldn't be, um, because if it was capable of change, then there must be something that can, you know, change it, if that makes sense, like something that can affect it. But because um, the prime mover doesn't have potential to change, or, you know, just potential in general, then he came to the conclusion that it would have to be eternal because if something cannot cease to be, then it cannot change. So if the prime mover exists, then it must have always existed and therefore it can't be influenced or changed in its ways. Um, if that, 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 I guess that kind of makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> Philosophy's weird. Um, but because there's this whole idea of badness, um, being related to, like, an absence of a thing, then the prime mover must also be purely good because it cannot lack something, um, if it's, like, the ultimate, like, cause or an um, like, like the ultimate effect of everything, um, so it, it's like, it's pure actuality, it's, it's hard to explain, <laughs> but it, it's pure goodness, it, it cannot lack something, like it, it being good, therefore it cannot be bad, um, but there's also this idea that it must be the prime mover must be immaterial and beyond time and space because all matter is capable of being acted upon and changed and therefore the prime mover can't be inside of matter like it not inside of it can't be made of matter it can't exist in the same way that we do um it has to kind of be this like purely spiritual um thing that uh, exists outside of us, <laughs> um, which is very strange, <laughs> because if it exists outside of us, how does it have any effect on us and how we are? Like, like, how can it be the ultimate cause of everything if it's not even acting within the same space and, like, ballpark that we do, you know? Um, but, yeah, I don't know, it's, um, it's a weird one. <laughs> it's 
difficult to evaluate like Aristotle's work as a whole because he often like lacked clarity um but I don't think that's necessarily a um that's like an argument against all philosophers there's normally a lack of either clarity or evidence um it's kind of the general argument against it all but he um his idea of the prime mover in general is like regarded as um super like too complicated um i am losing the ability to speak i'm so tired now <laughs> um but it 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 just doesn't make sense to have something outside of our universe exist because then it has no relevance to us it's not if it's not part of the world and has no interactions with us and isn't affected by us and it doesn't it doesn't matter to us we can't affect it therefore it has it bears no relevance on on the way we live you know <laughs> i say you know like you've replied to me at all i have no idea when you fell asleep but <laughs> i'm very glad that you're not awake to hear me stumble over stupid philosophy <laughs> ideas um yeah <laughs> i guess i'm gonna shut up now and go to sleep as well <laughs> oh you're very cute <laughs> I will ramble to you about philosophy more when you're awake. <laughs> Send you right back to sleep. <laughs> Good night, baby. I love you. <laughs> I hope you have good dreams and they're not confusing and about philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye.